Hey, thanks, everyone. Thanks for coming. So, uh, oh. <laughs> so, uh, so th these remarks really are not very academic. Uh, they come from uh, experiences I've had over the last 18 months um, in Europe and South America, uh, to some extent in North America, but mostly Europe and South America where to my uh, astonishment, really, uh, I've seen that in policy-making circles, including law circles, uh, there's keen interest in choice architecture and nudging in a way that, in terms of uh, creativity, ingenuity, uh, ambition, and uh, sheer force of will and intellect, way outruns anything that uh, Dick Thaler and I uh, could have imagined when we started our, our project. So uh, it's really a tribute to the um, problem-solving uh, goals of public officials all over the world to see uh, the outpouring of interest. Now, in seeing that, one thing I noticed was that the concept of nudging and its applicability concretely uh, requires more clarity, maybe, uh, than uh, had existed before. So academic discussions are one thing. Uh, they can have benefits in terms of refinement and subtlety. Uh, but something can be lost in the translation, which is a sense of pragmatic uh, usefulness. And there's, there's a risk, I think, that academics sometimes get trapped by abstractions. It's as if words are like a rocket and uh, it's, it's taking us away, they're taking us away. <laughs> so uh, dealing with people, as I recently myself was, who have concrete policy-making responsibility kind of concentrates the mind. And uh, these remarks are intended to uh, give you a sense both of what the project uh, can particularly include, uh, what the objections and concerns might be, and uh, what the current uses and, and values and challenges are. OK, so here are developments. Uh, there is a behavioral insights team in the United Kingdom. It was created by 
uh, Prime Minister Cameron pretty early, and it's had a series of significant successes in using nudging and behavioral sciences as a way of uh, improving lives for people in the United Kingdom. Uh, the leader of the group, David Halpern, has a book coming out in a few months called, I believe, The Nudge Unit, and they are kind of the flagship in terms of public prominence for a dedicated entity. <coughs> Uh, the United States now has a social and behavioral sciences team, uh, which is uh, coordinated out of the White House, but which includes many people throughout the federal government who are trying to figure out ways to uh, use communications in a way that will be more effective, uh, to use behaviorally informed strategies that will enable the government to serve the public a bit better. Okay, one little idea, which so far as I'm aware hasn't been institutionalized, but one little idea that I know people there are aware of, is you can save taxpayers money if you go to double-sided printing as a default rather than single-sided printing as a default. That's something that is uh, non-trivial in terms of the economic savings. I think even more than its non-trivial economic savings, it gives a clue about the immense power of default rules. Uh, the German government, my experience is, is extraordinarily professional and competent. They are really good. And Chancellor Merkel has recently created a, uh, a group that is interested in the behaviorally informed approaches. It's caused a great deal of really interesting discussion in Germany about ethics and manipulation given various um, uh, experiences in Germany uh, over the last decades, that's no surprise. The German Constitution highlights dignity. I think that's in the first provision of the German Constitution. And the intensity of the discussion in Germany is extremely interesting and, and I think quite productive in terms of figuring out what the uses and limits are. There's activity in many countries, including Canada, Mexico, Colombia, Italy. There are uh, nudge entities in Denmark and Sweden and elsewhere and they're growing up with uh, great speed and they're attracting tremendous talent. I think there is something in the world which it's worth putting a finger on. We can call it the Behavioral Insights Team Heuristic. And like most heuristics, it's a heuristic that generally works well but can create a lot of trouble. So the Behavioral Insights Team heuristic measures the, uh, uh, the use of behavioral insights by asking the question, is there a behavioral insights team in that nation? Now that's a heuristic that's not terrible but it's not really good. And the reason it's not really good is in the United States, there hasn't been a behavioral insights team of any kind until relatively recently, 2013. But the Omaba administration used a lot of, uh, of thinking about how to make a policies work in a way that's informed by empirics. So the Affordable Care Act has automatic enrollment for large employers coming up this year, 2015. Uh, the Affordable Care Act has a lot of disclosure policies. Uh, I received just a few days ago, and maybe you have too, simplified health insurance information as part of your uh, occasional accounting. Some of that is required by the Affordable Care Act so people can do comparison shopping and actually keep track of stuff. And that is not a product of any behavioral team it's a product of uh, knowledge on the part of people who are involved in policy in what kinds of tools might have good effects. Uh, in 2009, when I was in the Obama administration, I got a call, or my assistant got a call from the Republicans saying, we want you to help us with our alternative to the terrible thing that the Obama administration is doing. Now, I couldn't really respond to that call, of course, because I work in the Obama administration, but I was interested in trying to figure out why they would be calling me on an alternative. And the reason is that the people, Senator Coburn in particular, but there were others, uh, were very alert to the behavioral stuff. They didn't like the individual mandate that the Obama administration was pressing, but they did like the idea of 
uh, making it easier for people to have health insurance. And their proposal was to have automatic enrollment for employers rather than to have uh, a mandate. And that was clearly behaviorally informed. Senator Coburn and his colleagues did not have a behavioral insights team. They didn't need one. So this is just a way of saying that it might be that the most promising way forward uh, doesn't involve at least exclusive focus on a dedicated team, but does involve uh, knowledge that's uh, in the hands of uh, very high level officials. And I think there's no question that whether we get a Republican or Democratic president in 2016, the administration will to some extent be using work of this sort. Okay, uh, the World Bank report. This is uh, stunning, I think that the World Bank report for 2015 is dedicated really to behavioral insights in thinking about how to handle problems of development and poverty. That's the focus of the several hundred page report. The reason that's stunning is that the idea that the World Bank focused in this report on poverty and development should devote the entire enterprise to behaviorally informed approaches uh, is suggestive of, what is it, maturation, post-adolescence? So the idea here, this is from the president of the World Bank, is insights into how people make decisions can lead to new interventions to help households to save more, firms to increase productivity, communities to reduce the prevalence of diseases, parents to improve cognitive development in children, and consumers to save energy. You might think about infectious diseases, and Ebola, of course, is the recent example. And, uh, there's, I think, obvious ways to think about the application of behavioral insights to how to reduce the incidence and maybe control the disease, and also about why people might be getting really scared when the statistical risk is, is not that high. Okay, uh, let's go back, if we can, to 1960 to 2000. So this is the Beatles, uh, the Beatles era, but it actually goes 2000 is a little inaccurate. It actually goes right up to Taylor Swift. So 2000, we're, we're into 2015, notwithstanding the 2000 limit. Uh, some of this you've probably been taught in school here, some of what I'm describing. And that's good because it has, it's foundational and much of it is actually <coughs> true enough to be worth teaching. So uh, the first idea is that human beings are rational, uh, that they are uh, able to calculate probabilities and maximize expected value, uh, that they are responsive to incentives, uh, that according to the Coase theorem, the initial allocation of entitlements doesn't matter. So if someone has a right to get an injunction, uh, and the injunction's issued, people bargain their way around the injunction, if it's a silly injunction, to, a, to, the, to the efficient and right solution, so long as transaction costs are zero. And so the main policy prescription is to improve incentives. I think that slide captures uh, at least much of the core of social science wisdom uh, about how to think about the interaction of law and society. And the, the idea that certainly influenced administrations uh, from Reagan to the present is that if you want to do something, the thing to focus on, like a laser, is what are people's incentives and try to improve them, uh, positing that people are, uh, broadly speaking, rational. Okay, the relevant behavioral objections starting in the 1970s are numerous. I'm going to give the ones that seem to have the most important consequences for policy. Okay, people show present bias in the sense that they suffer from inertia and procrastination and often think of the future as a distant land which they may never get a plane ticket to visit. So here's one little illustration of present bias and its uh, relevance to policy making. Oregon recently, within the last few weeks, developed a system of automatic voter registration. It's the only state in the nation to do that and it's I think remarkably interesting, and at least on first and probably second gla glance, terrific. The idea is if you're in Oregon and they have information knowing that you live there and are of the right age, you're a voter. And unless you opt out after you're told you're a voter, and not a lot of people are gonna opt out, you're gonna get materials 
which will enable you to vote by mail within a short period before the election. You're a voter. You don't have to register. And that will make, uh, by the state's projections, many thousands of people voters who would not otherwise be just like that. I was in Denmark uh, last week, and I remarked with enthusiasm that Oregon had done that. And the response by my uh, uh, Copenhagen hosts was, in Europe, I think every country does that. <laughs> Now, there are some logistical issues for the United States where it's local and there may be people going from one state to another that make it a little more challenging. Uh, nonetheless, if you think that people don't register to vote, partly because they think they'll do it tomorrow, there's, uh, there's a clear sense in which this can over overcome present bias. But the, the, the domain of present bias as a policy challenge is very large. It bears on a wide range of, of problems, including health problems. OK, that uh, causes a challenge for calculation of, of expected value if uh, even a discounted 2019 is treated as if it's a foreign country then there's a problem. We know that people are loss averse in the sense that they like gains less than they dislike losses. Uh, Bill Belichick, after he won the Super Bowl, said something like, we're feeling a lot less happy than they're feeling sad. <laughs> and he got it completely. Uh, a, a, a victory makes people happy, a loss people makes miserable, people miserable, and the magnitude of a loss is higher than the, than the magnitude of a gain, even if they're equivalent. One way in, in, mag, in dollar amount, one way to make this plain is uh, by counting another sports fact, which is that when golfers are putting, I'm not a very good golfer as you can see, but at least I make the gesture, the putting, that's putting, yeah? Putting looks like this. You're looking incredulous. That is what it looks like. I'm not that bad a golfer. <laughs> uh, if you're putting for par and you're a professional golfer, you're more likely to make the putt than if you're putting for birdie. In fact, if professional golfers putted as well for birdie as they putt for par, they'd stand to make a lot more money each year. That's bizarre, isn't it? A stroke is a stroke. Why is it that putting for par produces more accuracy than putting for birdie? It's that just an artifact of what counts as par makes it so that if you miss that par putt, you've bogeyed, that's a loss. If you miss that birdie putt, if you make the birdie putt, you've gained relative to par, that's a gain. And so a birdie is less good than a bogey is awful which means that loss aversion is going to kick in, and that's what the data shows. Here are two policy-relevant analogies. Uh, DC tried to encourage people not to use bags that are produced by CVS and have environmental and wa waste consequences by saying, if you bring your own bag, we'll give you a nickel. No effect. No effect. Then DC said, if you ask for our bag, we're going to uh, tax you a nickel. Very significant effect. Uh, for teachers, an effort to use economic incentives, kind of standard style, by saying if you get your students' grades up, you'll get a bonus at the end of the year, has had very mixed effects. Another policy which says we'll give you a pot of money at the beginning of the year, and if the grades don't go, if the test scores don't go up, you're going to have to give the money back. That has a very large effect. Okay, a reflection of loss aversion. We know that entitlements tend to stick in the sense that, contrary to the Coase theorem, if you get something, you tend to value it more than you would value exactly the same thing if you didn't get it. Here's a way to demonstrate it. We can do it in your head. I happen to be hand uh, holding, they're very small, but I'm holding in this pocket a bunch of lottery tickets. This half of the room, you now have lottery tickets. You can't see them because they're so small, but magically they're right in front of you. Can you kind of see them? I'm trying to make the experiment work. <laughs> okay, now imagine uh, the lottery ticket costs $5. How much would these people have to pay you for you to give up your lottery ticket? Now, you have no lottery ticket. Sorry, guys. How much would you be willing to pay to get the lottery ticket from these people? Okay, if you all are like most populations. You were saying somewhere between zero and five. 
and you might well be saying somewhere between five and six. In any case, the median demand to give up the lottery ticket here is going to be higher than the median willingness to pay to get it, which suggests that we can create an endowment effect instantaneously. Here's another way to do it. This half of the room, you are now proud owners of the book Nudge. <laughs> you aren't. How much would you demand to, from people to give it up? How much would you be willing to pay to get it? You all are going to say a higher amount than the rest of you. And that's the endowment effect in action, and it confounds the Nobel Prize winning Coase theorem. And legal entitlements typically create endowments. They give initial entitlements. And they're like lottery tickets or books. OK. Uh, we know that people often don't do well with probability. If an event has co come recently to mind, they may be more scared than reality warrants. If an event doesn't come recently to mind, they won't. We know that people tend to be unrealistically optimistic, other things being equal, and they have limited attention. <laughs> I will illustrate this with the availability heuristic. It says the people assess the frequency of a class or the probability of an event by the ease with which instances or occurrences can be brought to mind. Think, if you would, in the next week of, or in the last week of things that seemed worrisome or didn't. It's probably a reflection of recent events, whether someone you know or you experienced something bad. Uh, I know. In the aftermath of the tragic flight yesterday, I'm not that excited about flying. But that probably is irrational. <laughs> OK, how many of you know the invisible gorilla experiment? OK, about a third. I'll t tell all of you about it. I think it's profoundly important. Uh, the invisible gorilla experiment has people counting passes on a basketball court. And your job is to say how many passes have been made. You can find it on YouTube. And after the experiment, I was a participant in one of the experiments, the experimenter says, did you see the gorilla? And I remember very clearly my reaction, which was, that's a joke, right? <laughs> or this is a crazy experiment. And in my group of Harvard professors, probably about 35 people in the room, only one person raised his hand and said, I saw the gorilla. And my reaction to the guy was, he's playing a game with the experimenter. Then they replayed the tape, and there was the gorilla halfway through. The gorilla was invisible because we're counting passes and not, see, not focusing on all aspects of the film. In fact, I told my 24-year-old daughter about the invisible gorilla uh, film about eight months ago. And she said, can I see it? And I showed it to her. And I told her about the invisible gorilla and everything I've just told you. After she saw it, she said, where was the gorilla? <laughs> so even knowing about the invisible gorilla effect might not inoculate one. Okay, the reason this has policy relevance is that there are shrouded attributes of products which may involve late fees or penalties of various sorts or energy efficiency which uh, people may not pay attention to, but which can have large consequences. So the consumer, our consumer bureau is quite interested in this. And there are consumer type uh, entities in Europe which are focusing on the problem of shrouded attributes. OK, loss aversion. You already know about that. But that's a picture with colors. OK, here are behavioral policy claims emphasized in, in the aughts. Default rules really matter. So think about the uh, default rule on your printer. And think maybe about your default relationship to Harvard, if you have one. There are probably a lot of things that determine your relationship with Harvard that are just default settings that you haven't bothered to change. They're probably pretty good, but they might not fit your circumstance. They're going to stick frequently, even if they don't fit people's circumstance. Here's a little study that I think profoundly uh, captures uh, the power of default rules. It involved the OECD, where as a way of testing the power of defaults, in winter, they set the default settings on the thermometer down one degree Celsius. Question, what kind of effect would that have on uh, energy use and consumption in the relevant offices? Answer, significant. People just stuck with the default. 
even though they're a little colder. So that showed an extremely low cost way of saving energy. Also, in another iteration of the test, they set the default setting down by two degrees Celsius. Guess what happened? People turned it up again. The reason I think that's a profound study is it suggests generally with respect to defaults, people will stick with them unless it makes them too cold. <laughs> a pervasive fact of human life. Incentives may not matter much. So there are settings in which incentives aren't readily visible, so they can be disappointing policy tools. Choice architecture, meaning a setting on a website, a setting on a healthcare form, a setting in the terms of the layout of an office, can have significant effects on what people actually do. It's really important and it's not avoidable. Uh, if people suffer from behavioral biases of various forms, uh, they can benefit from a nudge. OK, what is a nudge? That's an elephant. People like elephants, so that's the, uh, those are elephants. <laughs> One might be nudging the other. Two food, that's a happy nudge. OK, that's a scandalous <laughs> nudge. OK, a GPS, I think increasingly that a GPS should be seen as the canonical defining example of a nudge. And the reason is that it is fully respectful of people's goals with respect to their preferred destination. And it just gives them guidance on how to get to their goals if that's what they want. So it is means oriented, it respects their ends, and it is soft in the sense that you can reject the guidance if you don't like it. So it has the dual feature of not challenging people's ends and of um, giving them complete power of opt out. Okay, that's uh, a urinal. At least half of you know that. <laughs> And, uh, but it's not just any urinal. This is a urinal in the Netherlands airport, which uh, has a painted fly on it. It's not a real fly. And the reason the fly was painted on it was that the Netherlands airport, they've had a problem of spillage. They painted the fly there, and it turns out that the painted fly reduced spillage by 44%. I don't know and don't particularly want to know how exactly they know that. <laughs> Apparently, men can't help but aim at the fly. Okay, the reason this is significant, I think, is it has something to do with attention. And if it's the case that some law, we might be just talking about enforcement or compliance, is like a urinal without the fly, then if you just paint the functional equivalent of the fly, you might be able to ramp up compliance by ramping up attention. Okay, there's a recent study suggesting that for educational outcomes for young children, text reminders to parents about things that might be done had a very significant effect, even though they're really cheap. A text reminder is like a fly, isn't it? It just dr draws attention to something salient, though you can ignore it uh, if you want. OK, here's uh, just data from Vanguard on uh, the effects of automatic enrollment on savings in various places. I think the most interesting feature of this is twofold. First, automatic enrollment is increasing participation at every level of the income distribution. This is real data from the United States. Automatic enrollment means you work, you're in a, a, a savings plan, you can opt out if you don't want to be. Even at relatively high end of the income distribution, we're seeing 100,000 plus, pretty high jump, near to 100% in participation in savings plans. At the low end of the distribution, there's a huge increase from 34% to 78%. Now, the reason that's significant is that across the political spectrum, there's uh, concern that Americans just aren't saving enough for retirement. There are things you might do that it would involve taxpayer cost or education. They might be very expensive and intrusive as a way of ramping up those numbers. The mere uh, switch in the default rule has had a, a very, very large effect. And it's kind of gone viral in the United States. The United Kingdom, they've done something very similar and they've gotten very large results. 
Okay, so with a nudge, what we're talking about is a feature of the social environment that doesn't involve coercion or material incentives. I think that's one reason why the UK has been interested in this. A conservative government in particular wants to figure out low cost, choice preserving ways to uh, achieve social goals. So disclosure of information, as in credit card uh, notices, or the calorie labels, which are coming soon in the United States, where you go into the, uh, uh, the r restaurants and movie theaters, and uh, uh, you'll see calorie counts. I confess that I, have a fr I had some involvement in this rule at the proposed stage. And I confess a friend of mine sent me a note after the government finalized the rule, which was relatively recently, and the note said, Cass ruined popcorn. <laughs> It wasn't meant as an unfriendly note. It was meant as, a, well, there's a downside to this note. But I wasn't responsible for the rule, I hasten to add. But it does show that there's a potential welfare loss from disclosures. Uh, warnings, uh, default rules, framing, drawing attention to social norms, and reminders are examples of uh, nudges. Here's a framing example. Suppose uh, an entity tells you that uh, some product is 90% fat free. That sounds good. A lot more people are going to be enthusiastic than if it says this product is 10% fat. The government, aware of this, the United States Department of Agriculture, finalized a rule that said, sure, you can say 90% fat free. But if you do, you're going to have to say 10% fat also as a way of avoiding the induced bias that comes from the selective disclosure. If a doctor tells people 90% of people are alive after five years, if you have a certain operation, patients go for it. 10% are going to be dead after the five years. Patients don't go for it. They're equivalent in their meaning. And interestingly, that bias is exemplified by doctors as well. If doctors are told 90% are alive, they're asked, would you recommend the operation? Far more than if they're told 10% are dead. Framing is definitely a nudge. OK, what is not a nudge? A jail sentence, a criminal or civil penalty or fine, a subsidy or a tax incentive. None of these are nudges. Now, there's nothing intrinsic in the English language that justifies what I just said. You could understand those things to be nudges. So I'm just stipulating that those things aren't nudges on the intended definition. That's a way of getting some conceptual distinctions going. Uh, we've noticed that nudges are soft paternalism, and they are means paternalism. I just want to give one little example of something that's very much at the border of uh, a nudge and an incentive. You'll see why in a moment, which is quite revealing. And what I'm hoping for these examples is that they'll be uh, calling up uh, potential policy initiatives from the private or public sector in your minds that uh, you know will create a mass of 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 of, of improve thinking about what we might do. Here's the example. Uh, the ACT test, the twin to the SAT, uh, used to have in the 1990s a system where students could send three free reports to the colleges that they wanted. And then somewhere in the late 1990s, they said, OK, we'll give you a fourth. You can send four free reports. Why they did that unclear? To go to one more place is cost $6. So it's not a lot of money. They, but they said, for some reason, we'll go from three to four. The consequence of that for relatively wealthy students in terms of colleges atten attended was pretty close to zero. It had no effect. And that's not that surprising. But for poor students, the consequence was a significant number ended up in much better colleges. That's strange that you get to give one more free report, and people who would go to, let's say, a good state university end up instead at Princeton? What's going on there? It's at the border of a nudge and an economic incentive, because it is $6. But it's so small that it's very close to a nudge. I think here's what happened that students all over the country started thinking, you know, I'd apply to three local places, but why don't I give Stanford or Princeton or Harvard a chance? 
And a certain number of those people ended up getting in when they wouldn't have tried. And that means their whole life has changed, that their expected lifetime earnings and their career possibilities on average jump. jump. This question is, what are other applica potential applications of that idea? OK, here's the American model, which is not principally for the last period to rely on a dedicated nudge unit, but instead to use nudges as a policy tool just because you know that you have a bunch of possibilities and these are among them. So uh, some of you may have struggled with the financial aid form, the, the federal financial aid form. Uh, a recent study, recent-ish study, finds that if the federal government simplified the financial aid form in the United States and made it easier for students to navigate, it could have the same impact on college admissions as it would have by giving each student several thousand dollars more in annual financial aid. Two policy initiatives, simplify the form, give several thousand dollars to each student. Form simplification is a lot more attractive, isn't it? And that's actually what uh, the Department of Education has started to do, though there's a movement in Congress to do much more. It's bipartisan. I think Senator Alexander's behind the reform. It could have a massive effect on the college opportunities of poor kids in the United States. For fuel economy and energy efficiency, the United States has had very clear, simple labels so people can understand them. The mantra of our new Consumer Bureau is no before you owe. And some evidence suggests that portions of the 2009 Credit Card Act have saved over $70 million annually for consumers just by having clearer disclosure. OK, here's one that I confess a particular fondness for, which is that in the United States, a lot of kids are, have not been getting free meals to which they're entitled. These are quite poor children who were entitled to lunches and breakfasts. They haven't been getting them because their parents don't sign them up. And it's a nice question why their parents don't sign them up. Is it about uh, procrastination, inertia? Is it about fear? Is it about just busyness? The uh, Department of Agriculture, pursuant to congressional authorization, has adopted something called a direct certification program. And in 2012, 2013, 12 million American children were directly certified as eligible, which means they're eating nutritious meals. And a significant chunk of them wouldn't have been without the program, which just switches the default. That's all that it does. OK, uh, here's the old food pyramid, which I think should be taken as a metaphor for a bad practice. Uh, there's a person, gender unclear, marching to the top of a pyramid. What is that white triangle at the top? Is that like a plate with nothing on it? Is it thinness? Is it death? Is that where it's <laughs> And there, there's a, bunch, uh, there's a bunch of foods at the bottom. See them? And imagine you're a teacher or a parent trying to figure out how to feed your child or yourself, the foods aren't really recognizable, are they? What are the stripes doing? What do they connote? There's one thing that is recognizable. I, I can only see one clearly. It's the bottom right, which is a shoe. Isn't that clearly a shoe? Is that what the Department of Agriculture is recommending? Okay, That was eliminated in favor of this, which is a nudge. It says, Make, make half your plate fruits and vegetables, and you're basically uh, there. And the food plate, it's all over the United States. It's gone viral. It's sold in, in multiple forms, including for kids. And the reason this is instructive, whatever the ultimate data shows, is that much of government policy looks like this. And it doesn't work, because uh, not because people don't like it, but because they don't know what they're supposed to do. So I found on the regulatory front, the objection I probably heard most from corporate America was not, though I heard plenty of this, you're being too aggressive with regulation, but was instead, you're not clear. We don't know what we're supposed to do, which suggests that often noncompliance is not a product of resistance, but a response to ambiguity. OK. Uh, do nudges work? Here's the most important slide. 
Simplification of the financial aid form effect equivalent to a several thousand dollar educational subsidy. Uh, Opower, an energy company in the United States, and there are analogs now all over the world, uh, sends people a home energy report which tells people how their energy use compares to that of their peers. That has a result comparable in reducing energy use to an 8 to 20 percent spike in the short term cost of electricity. So if you're told that your own energy use is significantly higher than that of your peers, that can have a massive effect on energy use. Prime Minister Cameron's nudge unit has used that to decrease tax delinquency, not by threatening people or scaring them, but by saying you're among a small group of people in your community who haven't paid your taxes, won't you pay up? That by itself has had a significant effect in decreasing delinquency. That's a sufficient success story to make the whole nudge unit exercise worthwhile, probably, on the numbers in the UK. Here's the most dramatic, and I can barely believe it myself, I confess, having spent more than two decades at the University of Chicago. See if this is a sentence that seems to you believable, or does it have the form, you know, there are some Martians walking in Harvard Square right now, and believe it or not, they're 12 feet tall. See if this has that degree of, is that, that's not true, is it? Okay, so see if this has that degree of uh, lack of credibility. Here's the, the finding. That in Denmark, automatic enrollment in, um, in uh, savings plans has had a much bigger effect than significant tax incentives. If people are automatically in a pension plan, subject to costless opt-out, the effect in increasing savings in Denmark is a ton higher than a big tax incentive. The reason that's not credible is we know that a tax incentive, you're going to get money if you sign up, will have a big effect. And we know, at least I was taught, that automatic enrollment will have no effect if people can costlessly opt out. Nonetheless, the data is as the data is, and it's real. The tax incentive has very little effect. Automatic enrollment has a huge effect. Okay, in what other areas is the concentration on incentives misdirecting our policies in terms of impact while also costing people some taxpayers some money? And are we leaving opportunity on the table by not thinking about uh, default rules? Okay, I think at this point uh, I'm going to get rid of that mean slide and, <coughs> and uh, talk about uh, a couple other ideas and then ask for questions. So one pervasive concern, and I've seen this particularly in Germany, also in the United States, and it's in the United Kingdom also, is a worry about manipulation. And the slide has a kind of uh, aggressive answer which probably doesn't surprise you, no. <laughs> uh, but the, the issue is more complicated than the aggressive answer suggests. It is true that an energy efficiency label or information about credit card usage or default rules needn't be manipulative so long as they are public and transparent. But it's also true that it would be useful to give an account of manipulation that's real and convincing and then to explore whether some, norm, some nudges might cross the line. So if we think of manipulation, and this is just a first cut at it, as appealing not to people's reflective and deliberative capacities, but trying to activate some unconscious or subconscious process, then we can explain why some interactions are manipulative. And we might be able to see some nudges as questionable on that ground and to be avoided for that reason. And the question is whether anything that governments have done under the behavioral rubric or might do in the future do actually transgress the line. That, that is a, a le legitimate question. OK. Uh, I think at this point, uh, all I'm going to do is say a word about poverty and disadvantage, which is a frontiers area. Um, we know from work done actually mostly at Harvard that poor people have a big cognitive load such that if you ask poor people to solve a hard financial problem that they themselves might be facing, their IQ drops on a subsequent IQ test 
the drop in the ballpark of having no sleep the night before, which suggests that uh, the state of being poor can have very severe consequences on people's problem-solving capacities, which means that compliance with various legal requirements, including legal requirements that are part of anti-poverty programs, might be clueless and counterproductive because they run right into the obstacle that one of the many challenges people struggling with poverty face is they just have too much to worry over. Okay, there is a persistent problem of take up and the question is what can be done with respect to multiple programs that are designed to help people that can make it uh, easier. I think uh, that's all I have to say for now. There are 75 more slides, but you're not going <laughs> to see them. Uh, questions, comments, ideas? Thank you so much. I'd like to know if um, we could compare that more to information or to education. And if education would have sorry, roots in Aristotelian ethics, like as more, uh, um, if you have more knowledge, you're going to be more freer, no? Is it have more freedom? Okay, is it? excellent. Okay, so. You could think of information provision as a nudge, and you could think of an educational system actually as a, a big, big nudge, where both are designed to increase people's agency or capaci capacity in the Aristotelian sense. So there's no question that that's true. Uh, I think it's very intuitive to see information disclosure as a nudge. It's less intuitive to see an educational system as a nudge, but it's not obviously wrong. Okay, fine. Then, then there's, I think, a big question, which is whether the, the idea of nudging should be focused mostly or exclusively on information provision. And then you could say there's a class of nudges, let's call them educative nudges, which should have a kind of pride of place. They should be what we prize. And there are some people who think that and who are very favorably disposed towards calorie labeling, toward credit card information, towards financial literacy, which is a little more time consuming than those things, uh, to the food plate, that those are all uh, promoting people's own agency. I think we should be careful about uh, seeing educative nudges, or in one sense Aristotelian nudges, as exhausting the category or even as deserving, uh, necessarily deserving pride of place. And, and here's why. Uh, uh, everything depends, I think, on the, con on the consequences of the nudge. And suppose you have an information campaign for, let's say, saving paper at Nebraska state government level. The expected result of the educational campaign against excessive paper use is none. It will have no effect. Financial literacy programs actually have a very unclear record. And a lot of reasonable people think financial literacy and education just doesn't work very well. People don't enjoy it, then they forget it. So you try to push in people's heads information about a diversified low-cost index fund is the way to go. They don't know what, what that is, and they don't re remember it very well, and the, the record is not great. It, the, it may be that it can do more good than what I've just said suggests, but the record isn't great. Some uh, empirically-minded people say, don't try to force people to learn stuff that they don't enjoy and that it's hard to retain not because they're dumb, but because they have things that are more important to them, and that's reasonable. Instead, give them a default rule into something that's good. And then if they want to learn and get into something else, by all means, let them. But to default them into, as Harvard does for its own employees, into a basically diversified low-cost index fund, that's better than forcing, let's say, you know, the faculty at large to become experts in this, this stuff. And that's a population of people who maybe would have, have a taste for it. So uh, default rules, I think, I think we should be very excited about default rules. Yeah. The White House, thank you. 
the White House has been pressuring universities and colleges to prohibit smoking on their campuses. Uh, it seems to me that this would uh, handicap any faculty member, student, or staff member who smokes from fully participating in higher education. Uh, when does a nudge become uh, bullying or penalizing? Okay, so on, on the White House on that front, I, I don't know anything about that. So uh, I don't uh, I just plead ignorance about the question. So if, if what's involved is moral suasion and warnings, then it's a nudge. If what's involved is financial uh, subsidies or th fines, then it's not a nudge anymore. What about, uh, what about expelling students who are caught smoking on campus or firing staff members or refusing tenure to faculty who smoke on campus? Okay, that would all be beyond a nudge. So the definition of a nudge, mind you, is choice preserving, no economic incentives. Okay, Dean Minow. Yeah, Dean. This is a little related to the first question. What is the effect of teaching people about nudges? Is the disclosure about how nudges work itself liberty enhancing? Does it undermine the critiques of paternalism? Does it actually do nothing because people can't understand it? Uh, is itself a nudge? Uh, what's the effect of this kind of talk? It's a great question. So. Um, uh, I, we don't have a full answer, so I'll talk around it. One question is, if people are told, one part of the question is, if people are told that they're being nudged, does it, is it self-defeating? Such data as we have suggests not. So there's data on, on, in a paper called Warning You Are About to Be Nudged that asks whether people reject a default rule once they're told that the default rule's been chosen and it has an effect has no, no impact. If people in Denmark or the United States, for that matter, were told the default rule is chosen because we think it'll have an effect, people are nudged by default rules, it's most unlikely to undermine the effect. If people are told that the, the food plate was chosen because it has a simple clarity to it and it's designed to help people, uh, it wouldn't diminish the effect. It's kind of implicit in the whole thing. So, so a, a really nice question is: In what circumstances is full disclosure of a nudge going to defeat the point? Uh, if it does defeat the point, then I think the nudger should think with humility: Well, maybe I deserve to be defeated if transparency is inconsistent with the enterprise. That's kind of a, a, a reality check. Um, and you could probably imagine some nudges for which that would be true. Okay, another way to get at the question is to think, if you tell people about behavioral biases, do they go away? And so does a f discussion of the nudge project make the nudge project less necessary? Because people understand that, that is itself a kind of global nudge. I'll, I'll tell you a little story that is suggestive, which is that in 2011, I think it was, the stock market started going down, and I was working for the government. And while there wasn't, sad to say, a ton of money in there, I kind of depended on it because I have kids, and my wife's working for the government too. So I thought, sell, time to sell. So before selling, I, I called up, I emailed my co author, Thaler, and said, Should I sell? And he said, Read our book. <laughs> and, and I didn't really know what he was talking about. I was kind of scared. And so I sold. And I called him or emailed him and said, what exactly in our book did you mean? It's a long book. And he said, the part about not selling. <laughs> Said that, and of course, my decision was idiotic and lost a lot of money. And I know all this stuff. So uh, uh, it's instructive, I think, that, uh, that Thaler and uh, the, Tversky and Kahneman, who started all this work, the way they thought of the heuristics was not to think, uh, how are we better than other people? But they thought, how do we fail? <laughs> And uh, I think it, 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 it might be there's an inoculating effect against nudges by learning about it or against behavioral mistakes by learning about them. But we don't have great data suggesting either. So I think those who know about this stuff, maybe many are all the more appreciative of sensible default rules. I have one more. Yeah. So I don't quite understand 
understand the emphatic no answer to the question of why uh, is this manipulative? Why isn't the question the answer like? Of course it is, and that's what government does. Like the, um, like the, um, we want the government to try to change people's behavior in ways that serve the social good, and that sometimes serves their good. Um, and that's why we have tax incentives. That's why we have criminal law. That's why we have everything the government does. Um, okay, we we need an account of manipulation. So the idea of changing behavior. Uh, would not be, would it, coextensive with, with manipulation? So if you had uh, a threatened fine for theft, that's not manipulative. It's just coercive. So if it's you, deception that makes something manipulative? Well, or is, what's, what's, what's big, the normatively this, bad This thing? is a big question. And uh, I'm working on this now. And you're right to, to ask it. My provisional definition of manipulative is an action is manipulative is if, if it doesn't sufficiently engage people's reflective or deliberative capacities. So if you say to someone, um, you know, uh, uh, without deception that, uh, uh, if you do X, um, uh, 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 your mother would be so proud. <laughs> uh, and let's suppose your mother is either deceased or alive. That probably exhausts the probabilities. <laughs> your mother would be so proud if you do this. That's manipulative because it's not really getting you to deliberate about the thing in question. It's, it's, it's appealing to your uh, something not quite unconscious, but some kind of emotional process. Wait, but if you want people to deliberate, you shouldn't have a default rule for anything. You should say there is no default rule. Like the, the thermostat comes with just blanks that you have okay. to fill in. And you just have to decide what, co what temperature you want. Okay. But you actually want to use default rules to achieve okay, good, good ends. So then the question is, is the default rule turn out to be manipulative by the def definition. And then we'd have to ask whether a default rule uh, sufficiently bypasses people's deliberative capacities. I don't think so, because a default rule is something which completely equips people to say, I don't like that. It doesn't, it's not like uh, appealing to their, it's not like giving you a picture of your mother when you're deciding whether to do something which you really want to do and think on reflection is right, but your mother wouldn't like. So, so the default rule you're right is a more challenging case than pure information disclosure, but it's not like a uh, emotional engagement. So, and I offer the definition provisionally. I think, but what we need to do is distinguish between manipulation on the one hand, coercion and incentivizing on the other hand, and persuasion or information provision. Do we have time for? Okay, great. Yeah. Oh, um, I mean, the general ideas are so rich, so generative that it's it's a little uh, hard to. Push back. I mean, you're looking at implementation, you're looking at actual effects uh, on citizens, and that seems important to the extent we're paying attention to anything. But maybe just asking about a few things. One, in terms of, you know, the, the, the energy saving stickers, for me, the interesting question wouldn't be so much is this at the border of manipulation uh, or a nudge, but just um, what are the effects of the energy uh, efficiency stickers? In other words, do people, if they see, people see they're going to spend, save $12 a year in energy when they're looking at the wall of TVs at the Best Buy, and maybe there's an expected life of the TV of five years or 10 years or whatever. I mean, are they spending more than the present value of the 12 bucks a year or less when they see the sticker or when they see something else? That sort of, to me, is the interesting follow-up question. Uh, with, the, with the college uh, ACT thing, I'm a little puzzled by uh, you're not just seeing this as a straightforward subsidy for low income, for the low income people where it seemed to make a difference. I mean, it seems to me, you know, people living paycheck to paycheck and they've got some colleges and the benefits of going to Princeton instead of Indiana are maybe hazy or unclear and you see the Princeton application is something of a long shot. Well, I mean, six bucks to us isn't a lot of money. I mean, uh, we're not fabulously wealthy people, but we're compensated more than average. But but for some people, the extra six bucks on a long shot 
really matters, and that just seems like a subsidy to me. I mean, I don't, I don't understand the characterization. Okay, so uh, you're right that it's possible that the $6 thing uh, just uh, helps because rational people were not taking a flyer. Uh, the, authors of, the author of the study is at the Kennedy School says if you run the numbers, uh, that Princeton application was clearly worth it, and people weren't, weren't doing it. Mm -hmm. So they were anchored on the three even though to go for a four to take a flyer would have been in their economic interest. Something like the, the, uh, the effect, the lifetime earning, discounted lifetime earnings of the better school were on average, as I recall, around $100,000. And the chances in the yeah, relevant. although that's very mixed data, right? Because mm -hmm. if you fix the kid as opposed to just the school, no. I mean, no, this, is a, this is a hot argument, I, so I, I, think, I just don't I, know. I think you're right. It could be true. It could, it could be true that it was a rational decision. Mm -hmm. Even so, if so, it's a pretty, pretty good subsidy program. Sure. So on the disclosure, I completely agree. Everything depends on the data. And one of the most interesting ones uh, involves calorie labeling, where the, the data is uh, mixed. There are some studies that are suggesting a significant impact, others not. Uh, there's much less knowledge out there right now than we need to get on the effects of information disclosure. Thank you. I think that's it's ten past one, and that's about about it for today. Thank you again. Thank you for your Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.